Hey everybody, I'm Mel Todd. I'm the author of the Twisted Luck series and the owner and primary writer for Bat Ash Publishing. So I wanted to tell you about the audio book you're about to listen to. It's called Join. It's the story of Joe and Sable's wedding, but mostly it's actually a story about friendship and about how important people can be in our lives and that family can take any form. I really hope you enjoy it. It's a short novella and it takes place in between inherited luck and drafted luck. Thanks. Joined, a twisted luck novella. Written by Mel Todd. Narrated by Autumn Juliet. To those that love without boundaries. Chapter 1 Ritual marriages or joinings are relatively rare and tend to be more the provenance of those that follow Wicca, but they are legal and as binding as a standard marriage or civil union. History of Magic Even though I normally made double time working during holidays, I'd specifically asked for this 4th of July off. Josepha Guzman, my best friend, Sable Lancet, her girlfriend, and I were throwing a party at the Guzmans, Joe's parents, and there was no way in the world I'd miss this. Joe had graduated with her master's in May, and her draft started in September. I was on track to graduate next year, and while starting the draft didn't excite me, being done with school did. Sable was two years into her four-year draft, and the two of them were still head over heels in love. Some days, that didn't surprise me as much as the fact that they included me in their family. They took in me, Corisan Monroe, whose own parents ran away from her and treated me like one of their own. I growled at myself to get over it. It didn't matter anymore. Today was going to be glorious and I planned on enjoying every minute of it. The large backyard was decorated with ribbons, streamers, and balloons. When you had the large Guzman family, Sable, her father, and me plus Carolyn, it made for a lively bunch. We also invited Charles Wainscott and his familiar Arachina, though I had to threaten to cut off all his hair to get him to come. He still wasn't sure why he was here, but the cheerful acceptance of him and his spider-like familiar by the Guzmans, not to mention Marisol Guzman's cooking, was quickly winning him over. Carolyn, my feline familiar, was perched on a stand Henry Guzman had built expressively for him, about four feet off the ground and six feet wide at the top. It was big enough he could sprawl out, but at the right height that everyone walking by could pet him, Henry had also built steps so the grandkids could climb them to cuddle with Carolyn. He also included a soft mat that could be brought out as the grandkids thought jumping off was fun. Carolyn just jumped up to his perch, lord of all he surveyed, his ruby red coat gleaming in the summer sun. Joe's older brothers had gotten married, and Marco had two girls while Paolo had a baby boy on the way. All of them treated me like their sister, even Stinky, well, Sanchez, had found someone that he was dating, if not seriously, yet. It left me the only one without a partner, but I didn't mind. Charles and I were friends, regardless of the occasional teasing from each other, but Joe and Sable didn't tease, just hugged me and kissed my temple. Being loved was pretty damn nice no matter how giddy I was about today. The sky was just starting to go dark at around eight, and I stood by Carolyn on his perch. One of Marco's kids, Angelique, I thought, was curled up next to him half asleep, but wanting to see the fireworks. I do not understand all this rigmarole, Carolyn's voice said into my mind, a supercilious air coating the words. Though I approve the food, Marisol's tasty meat pepper things are worth taking to Esmir. I laughed, 
His mother, Esmir, was almost worse than he was. They are called armadillo eggs, and yes, they are tasty, and if you ask nicely, she will probably save some for her. But you will wait. I managed to hiss the words, even mentally, as he lifted his head looking around. He sighed and settled back down, Angelique burying her head into his side, her long, dark locks much like her aunt's. Fine. She is warm. He leaned down and licked her hair, and the little girl giggled. You will make a fine mother someday, he said, an odd wistfulness to his tone. Me? I squeaked, looking at the cat. Um, no. Look at Sable or Joe. They'll be much more likely to have kids. In vitro fertilization is a wonderful thing. He didn't say anything, just licked his shoulder. I started to snark at him, but stopped as Joe stood up. She was wearing shorts and a tank top, showing off every inch of her lean body. She still loved the gym and had gotten Sable addicted to yoga with her. The only girl in the family, she was still spoiled and protected by her brothers, but they all agreed Sable was excellent for her. And I didn't disagree. Sable, with her hair in a mass of tiny black braids and a smile that lit up her face, was over by the buffet table picking over the fruit. Sable, would you come over here, please? Her voice cutting through the air. It made me wonder if she had used a bit of air magic to make it so clear. Everyone stopped and looked at her. I bit my lip, watching. Sable arched a brow, a smile tugging on her lips, but walked over, setting her plate down on her chair. Yes, oh crazy one. Her tone teasing as she moved over. Joe laughed and dropped a kiss on her lips. They were just different enough in height that they danced wonderfully together. Yes, I am crazy. Crazy in love with you. And after much deliberation, I have come to the decision that I cannot live without you. In a graceful move that I knew would have seen me faceplant, Joe dropped to one knee and pulled out a ring. Sable, will you marry me? The box she had in her hand held the ring we'd spent hours debating over. It was a rose gold with a gem for each of Sable's classes. In center was a dark blue sapphire for water, bracketed on the left with a fire opal for fire and a black opal for entropy. They weren't huge, but the blue in the middle pulled the colors out of the opals and it danced with light and joy. Sable had gone still, looking at the ring, her eyes wide as the rest of the guests all waited. Really? Her voice but a whisper as she looked down at Joe. Really? Marry me? Marry us? Joe said, even softer. Sable glanced up at me and Carolyn, and I tried hard not to do anything but seem supportive and thrilled. How could I ever say no? Yes! A cheer went up from all the guests as Joe slipped the ring on her left ring finger, then sprang up to give her a hard kiss. When they broke apart, amid laughter and joy, Sable smiled at her. I suppose that means I should give you this. She pulled another small box out of her pocket and held it up. Joe frowned and opened the box and pulled out a ring. Also, in rose gold, it had a diamond in the center for her transform. On one side was a koroi opal for pattern, and the other side was a white opal for air. The two women turned to look at me, and the giggles I'd been fighting all evening took over, and I fell to the ground laughing, tears falling from my eyes. They had both approached me separately, wanting to propose today and had sworn me to secrecy. I had talked them into matching rings that I knew they would love, but were still completely unique, and from two different jewelry stores at that. The Guzman clan looked at me, then the girls, and laughter filled the area as they could guess exactly what had happened. Sable and Joe marched over to me, pulled me up, 
I was still laughing too hard to even try to fight. You are an evil, wicked woman, Joe declared as she and Sable held me at arm's length. I was still laughing and bobbled my head up and down. You both approached me, so I made sure your rings would match and never let anyone know. I knew, Carolyn sniffed, but they are pretty bobbles. Joe and Sable looked at their rings, then yanked me into a hard hug, smothering me with kisses. I laughed and held them tight, kissing their cheeks. I love you both. Never forget. We know, they replied in unison, and the laughter started all over. The afternoon was spent spending time getting lots of hugs. So... This was the real reason you twisted my arm into coming? Charles asked after most of the Guzmans had tried to smother me with hugs. Marisol was beside herself at getting to plan another wedding, while Sanchez was very happy to have his mom focused on something other than his relationship status. Yep, figured you'd been involved in our madness enough lately that you deserve to see it. I responded, leaning against Carolyn's perch. Arachina slid out from under Charles' hair. She tended to hide in the hood of his ever-present hoodies. With quick movements, she skittered down his arm, then leapt over to the perch and scrambled on top of Carolyn. Angelique didn't even blink. Gina, she murmured, then cuddled in closer to Carolyn, almost fully asleep. Thank you. It was adorable without being overly cute he said after a minute. They do make a delightful couple. I thought so. I beamed. Seeing them happy made me pleased in a way I couldn't express. What's next? Heck if I know. That is all of them. I need to work this summer, then back to school in the fall. Final stretch. Charles nodded, watching the Guzmans and Sable and her dad. Somehow... I suspect it is going to be a bit more complicated than that. Shush, no jinxing it. I bumped his shoulder with mine, and we focused on getting more to eat. Chapter 2 While all legal marriages must have an officiant, there have been rumors of people being married by magic, which, while a fascinating idea doesn't change the legal requirements of being legally linked by local laws. History of Magic Time flowed as it usually does, with school and holidays flashing by, and before I realized it, March had arrived, and pressure was bearing down on everyone. Me for my thesis and starting the draft, Joe and Sable for the wedding this summer. I was fully ensconced in the research for my thesis when Joe barged into my room, making me jump. Sable had found a nice apartment with her draft placement, and my room was big enough that I just moved my desk into it. It worked out better as Joe and Sable were both serving their draft, while I still needed to study. Having my desk in my room made it quieter for me, and this way we could use the living room for fun stuff, and not fight around my books or computer. Corey, you have to help! Mommy has gone insane! Joe blurted out before my bedroom door had finished bouncing off the wall. Carolyn looked at her and dove under the bed. Coward, I hissed in his direction. So far, both of us had managed to avoid all the wedding prep, which didn't hurt my feelings much. Part of me wanted to be more involved, but the PhD was absorbing most of my energy. What's the problem? Marisol kept wanting to go more than a bit overboard with her only daughter getting married, no matter how much Joe and Sable kept trying to rein her in. Purple and orange, Joe stated in horrified tones. Ew, I blinked. What happened to... I struggled to remember the colors I last heard. Yellow and pink? Too gauche and not classy enough. And purple and orange? I try not to squeak, because those two colors together sounded garish. The newest thing in the wedding magazines, Joe replied, 
I groaned as Jo threw herself into the reading chair next to my desk. It was a really nice big room. Okay, do we need to do an intervention? Yes, please. Sable is swamped in our job. I finished all my draft training, which really was mostly boring, and I start next week. Army Corps is going to have me busy out at Lake Near, and I'm not going to have time. Please, Corey, I at least trust your taste. I bit my lip, thinking. I loved Marisol. She treated me like her own from the day Joe declared me her best friend. I had no desire to hurt her, but she was letting wedding fever go a bit to her head with her only daughter. Okay, what colors did you and Sable want? I asked, trying to figure out a way to control the minefield. We wanted to match our rings, so dark blue for our sapphire, and since a diamond is white, as is my opal, we were thinking just silvery white with black accents to match my ring. Oh, that could be really pretty. You two decide on what you were wearing? Joe nodded, a smile lighting up her face. Yes, as well as you. And yes, you are wearing a dress. You look cute in them. I rolled my eyes at that. Jeans were preferable, but I had learned to dress well. That spawned an idea. Do you trust me? With my life? Yes. My wedding? Yes. Cooking? Never. Hey, I protested. I'm getting better. Hugh got distracted last week and burned one of my pans making hard-boiled eggs. Joe countered, glaring at me. She was still peeved, and I couldn't blame her. I rubbed the back of my neck. I've already ordered a new pan, I offered. Still, but in answer to your question, sure. Why? Joe looked curious as I smiled. Just go. I'll take care of Marisol, and you'll love it. But you are okay with a few extra guests, right? Joe shrugged. Sure, though I can't see the community hall holding much more than a hundred, and we already have 65 confirmed. Even Abuela Guzman is coming, and she rarely leaves her place. This should be one or two extras, I think. Go, I've got this. I was grinning, trying to keep my amusement to a low roar. Marisol would never know what hit her, and would never be hurt at all. I'm starting to think I should have just eloped to Vegas. Okay, Corey. Go for it. She stood and dropped a kiss on my head. I do love you, even if you ruined my pen. New one, on the way. I mock glared at her, and she shrugged and headed out. I waited until I heard her leave the apartment before centering myself. What are you planning on doing, my queen? Carolyn asked, though he didn't move from being sprawled out on the bed. I am putting my ability to delegate into practice. It wasn't something I was very good at, but in this particular case, I had no skills at weddings, and I needed to get some more hours in before school started back up, so there was no way I could be the point person on this. He lifted his head, ears flicking back. Why am I suddenly worried? Because you are a very intelligent calf. I reached out and pinged Esmir, his mother, or Malkin. Esmir? Would you have time to do me a favor? Pinging was the equivalent of calling someone and letting it ring. Over the last few years, Esmir and I had become friends, though we still had areas where life caused some disagreements. They were mostly theoretical, and I thought she might get a kick out of this. Always shall I come through? Please, talking out loud is still less effort. I'd gotten better over the years, but still it required much more focus for my mental speech to be clear and concise. A sharp spike of pain, signaling a rip, opening between the planes, and Esmir just appeared in my room. As always, her size took me by surprise. The size of a Shetland pony with emerald skin and amber eyes. She was imposing, regal, and beautiful. And I still find your resilience on speech amusing. She paused to rub cheeks with Carolyn, who had jumped off the bed to greet her. Mine speech is a bit of a foreign language for me, but I am getting better. Hmm, was her only response as she made herself comfortable. So, you wanted a favor? This is actually more a favor for Joan Sable, I said, settling in myself. 
She flicked an ear at me while Caroline slithered under the bed. Marisol is going a bit wild with planning a wedding for her only daughter, and Joe and Sable are about ready to elope rather than deal with all this drama. As Mira lifted her paw, licking it with the claws extended, and why would you think that I would have any way of calming her down? Weddings are mostly human things. The rest of us don't assign so much ado about getting together. True, I said slowly, trying to sound considering. This was a very careful trap I needed to lay. But I figured since you and yours were invited, and there is no way we wouldn't invite Banyar on Tersane, that your uncompromising elegance might be just what she needs to elevate this to the next level. But if that isn't something you would like, I could ask your guess. He might enjoy planning this. That feather bowl? Esmir almost hissed. Carolyn had passed on that those two were having a feud. Something about Jorga's scaring away prey that Esmir had been stalking for days. He is gorgeous, and humans do love the elegant and exotic. How much more unique can you get than a phoenix? Esmir's eyes narrowed, looking at me. I kept a bland expression. I just figured you have such elegant taste that you could help Marisol create something otherworldly and suitable for the queens of your son and for the exalted guests, such as a lord of chaos. I smiled at her then, and her tail twitched. I still couldn't figure out what it meant to be a lord in the realms, but it was obviously a title not lightly handed out, and Esmir was the only one I knew. I'd rarely seen her do magic but I knew she could if she had any desire to. I must talk to Joe's Malkin. Having something not suitable for those who will be in attendance would not be wise, and my son does not choose poorly. Sure. Can you follow me if I sidestep? Though I need to call her first. We lived in Atlanta, and the Guzmans lived in Rockway, about an hour plus northwest of us, Sidestepping, though, would take me only a minute, as opposed to driving for hours. Of course, she huffed. I pulled out my phone. Afternoon, Marisol. How goes it? Ah, Corey, there is so much stuff to do. A wedding this summer? It is only four months away. And still they won't tell me exactly what they want. How am I supposed to plan the wedding of their dreams when they won't tell me what their dreams are? Marisol sounded almost panicked, and I wanted to strangle everyone involved. I think I might have a solution. You mind if I come over and bring a friend? Though Carolyn doted on Marisol, I didn't think she had met any of the friends. As long as you don't expect anything fancy, though I do have chips and salsa. Marisol sounded worried. No need for anything that isn't my friend's type of food. You'll see in a few minutes. See, me, uh, a few. I hung up, knowing that Marisol thought they would be there in an hour or so, not a few minutes. I assume you'll follow me. I can take people, but from what Joe and Sable say, it should only be used in emergencies. The first person I had sidestepped with had been all but unconscious, and I never did ask how he liked the journey to Japan. Yes, I will follow. Sidestepping with others is undignified. I snickered, saved my work, and stepped into the Guzman's backyard. It was a nice backyard, and the party where Joe had proposed last year had fit well, but there was no way it would hold a wedding. Esmir appeared beside me, the slash of pain barely noticeable as she opened and closed the rip. Come on, I'll introduce you. I walked over to the back sliding glass doors and pulled them open. Marisol, I'm here. Corey, how in the world? Marisol said, coming out of the kitchen drying her hands. She froze as she saw Esmir standing beside me, looking around. Tia Marisol, this is Esmir, Lord of Chaos. Marisol blinked, then grinned. You must be Carolyn's mother. It is so nice to meet you. You are just my beautiful. 
I like her, Esmir said, sitting down in the living room. I thought that maybe Esmir could help with wedding planning? Oh, Marisol frowned. I wouldn't mind some help, but all the magazines are saying one thing, then they come out next with something different. And neither of them knows what they want, they just say pretty. She threw her hands up in the air. Everyone says this has to be something for them to remember. But purple and orange? Ugh. She was more distraught than I'd ever seen her. Joe and Sable were going to get an earful from me. It was their wedding, not Marisol's. Young ones can be most obtuse. But why follow what your paper pictures say? These are my son's queens. Their ceremony should be one that the others want to emulate. Queens create the fashion, not follow it. Esmir's absolute certainty came through, and Marisol blinked. Set the style? Of course. Queens do not follow. They lead. Do you not want your daughter and the daughters of your heart to lead? Esmir glanced at me, and I narrowed my eyes. Esmir? what are you planning? I had a sinking suspicion that possibly getting those two together was not my best idea. Never you mind, child. Go. We matriarchs have a joining to plan. The way she purred those last words set every hair along the base of my neck standing straight up. Marisol smiled as she looked at me. Yes, I thank you, Cory. I believe we'll be fine. Ismir, do you like chorizo? They turned and walked into the kitchen as I stood there, a cold sweat creeping down my body from the base of my skull. Um, ladies? Goodbye, Corey. Give Joe and Sable my love, and tell Carolyn I will save some tamales for him next time. I recognized a dismissal when I heard one. With a hard swallow, I left, wondering if I had just started something I would intensely regret. I went out the back door then sidestepped back to my room, where Carolyn lay on my bed. Did you really just introduce my Malkin to Marisol to let them come up with wedding plans? His voice was absolutely neutral. Yes. I couldn't help but feel like there was a target on my back and that my great idea wasn't so great. You, my queen, are a fool and I shall laugh at your fall. He lay back down on the bed and refused to say anything else. Chapter 3 The joining of two mages is fodder for stories, and lots of romances include the theme of their magic joining. There is occasionally the measured increase in the ability to use null branches, but most mages never come back in for retesting. Magic Explained Online To my disquiet, I didn't hear anything else about the wedding from Marisol for at least a month, and when I finally dared to broach the subject to Joe, she just shrugged. Mommy said she had it all figured out and that we would love it. I've been so busy with work at Lake Lanier, I've not had time to worry about it. I couldn't argue that. Joe had been working 60-hour weeks trying to stop a collapse in the Lanier system, and even Sable had barely seen her. I was isolated with my classes and thesis. I couldn't wait to get out and work and earn a salary, even if the commitments I'd already made freaked me out. She didn't say anything? I probed cautiously. Joe looked at me blankly. No, no just that we had appointments for our fitting in two weeks. Why? Oh, nothing. Just, you know me, always worried that something will go wrong. I brushed off her concern. Maybe I was overreacting a bit. Mommy doesn't let things go wrong. It will be fine. I'm just glad she went away from purple and orange. This isn't a football game. Oh, what are the colors? Joe got a funny, sappy smile on her face. It was cute. Copper in dark blue matches my Koroi opal and her sapphire. Then, of course, white with pearlescent accent for the opals. 
Oh, that does sound pretty. The copper and blue would shine against their dark tans, and the blue would be vivid. See? Nothing to worry about. Though I'm so buying mom something incredible for Christmas. You should, I said, grinning, and let it slip from my mind. It was a wedding. Worst case, it rained. Six weeks before the wedding, which was scheduled for the last week in June, the weekend before the 4th of July, we headed up to try on dresses. Joe and Sable had written a check to have dresses made for the three of us. I still don't see why I can't just buy a standard bridesmaid's dress, I said. I'll never wear this again. I promise it will work for any fancy parties, and Indira said you will have a few you'll need to go to as Merlin in the draft. They apparently use you guys for diplomatic crap. Something we miss out on as archmages are much more common than Merlin's. I surpassed a groan. Getting dressed up fancy had never excited my soul, but I knew Joe wouldn't dress me in anything truly horrid. Which means, Sable interjected, we expect as your dearest friends to get tagged as your plus one or date as often as possible. I love to get dressed up, and if you can bring both of us, even better. Really? Merlin, yes, they both said in unison, and I laughed. Fine, I'll take you. Maybe Carolyn should come too. Wear a bow tie? I prefer an ascot, if you please. I looked at him, eyes wide, and saw Sable craning her head to look at him too. Then we all started cracking up, the image of him with an ascot just too cute. I still think you are crazy. It's only because I love you I'm willing to dress up this much. But I'll do it, even if you are crazy. I saw them exchange glances, then Sable turned back to look at me. Corey, Sable said from the front seat, turning to look at me. You are ours, our best person. You are the one that has been there for the last few years. You've supported Joe all through this journey. I'm aware of how many hours you spent reading to her when the dyslexia made some of the text almost unbearable. You were there when Dad got hurt and made sure I could get to him when the airports were closed. You've supported our relationship every step of the way. You are part of our marriage and our lives, and we wouldn't be here without you. She held my gaze the entire time, and I felt my face heat. I ducked my head, shrugging. It's what friends do. No, it's what you do, and we love you so very much. Someday you are going to look at your nieces and nephews, and I expect you to spoil them rotten. I focused on petting Carolyn, suddenly uncomfortable. Life hadn't been a bowl of roses the last few years. Draft work was usually hard and demanding. There were days where those two had depended on my cooking, which was always a risk. But they were finding their stride and Sable had kept ideas for patents she could file after the draft was over. But still, the idea of feeling that loved always made me feel unworthy, like I should try better or harder. So I would, and I tried to look forward to their special day. You figured out the wedding rings? I changed the subject, anything to get it off of me. Yes, we did, and Carolyn will be carrying them. Sable grinned, a mischievous smile on her face. Oh? I looked back at Carolyn, who was curled up in the hammock in the back. Yes, apparently I am the ring bearer. I agree to this only because the connotations of a great journey with a heroic end seem somehow fitting. He didn't look at me, just swayed gently to the rhythm of the car. You do realize the end is the altar? This isn't Frodo and Samwise on a journey to Mordor. J.R.R. Tolkien had written the definitive text on how to be a mage as magic washed across the world. But he was still called the father of fantasy, and his book still caused questions. How much of Middle-earth was the realms? If any of the denizens knew, they weren't sane. Even Esmir just said it was an interesting story, and nothing more. The symbolism is valid. That is all that matters. 
The ring will be protected with my life. What tales have you two been telling him lately? I asked, staring at the snickering woman. Nothing really. Just pointing out there might be great trial and acclaim involved in the effects. And lots of petting. Sable grinned, winking at me. What? Did Marisol include brushes as table favors? I asked. That sounded exactly like something Esmir would do. She would see no reason to not include ways for her to be brushed. Who knows, but probably. Joe shrugged as she signaled to take the next exit. But either way, it will be our wedding and it will be perfect. I didn't say anything, but I still worried. I'd have to be ready for anything. But surely with Esmir there and Banyarl probably attending... My mind screeched to a halt. Marisol didn't know who else to invite. Closing my eyes, both to distract me from Joe's expertly scary driving and to let me focus, I pinged Esmir. Yes, Gory. Do you know if Marisol remembered to send invitations to Banyarl and, well, everyone else? And how are they going to get them? It isn't like the post office delivers there. I was panicked. There wasn't that much time left, and... What if they couldn't come? Do you think I would not inform her of your friends in the realms? Though, really, that should have come from you. Do you hide here because you are ashamed? If so, you should be ashamed. Marisol is a smart, wonderful woman. It has been dealt with appropriately. Really, Cory, you act as if this is your joining. Go and leave those of us involved free from your Twitter patient. She snapped off the link, and I sat there blinking, with Carolyn laughing in my mind. I stayed silent the rest of the ride, trying to get over the smarting cut. I might be overreacting a bit. After all, I trusted her enough to help with the wedding. I should really trust her. Still, the world might never recover. What else were those two planning? There were days when I created my own problems. This definitely qualified. The car coming to a stop pulled me back into the land of dress trying, and I followed them in, carrying the shoes I'd be wearing for the wedding. Ladies, welcome! We are ready for you! A woman called out as we walked in. She was round as an apple and had rosy cheeks to match. Thanks, Lori. You have it set up the way we asked. Absolutely. Separate rooms so neither of you see the other's dresses, but Corey. She paused and grinned at me. It lit up her face, and you just knew she was the kind that baked cookies for her neighbors. She gets to bounce back and forth to see them, and you both get to see hers. Perfect, Joe said. Let's get this going. She dropped a kiss on Sable's upturned face, winked at me, and headed in the direction Lori waved. Oh, I can't wait. Sable didn't squeal, but she obviously was excited. I just laughed and followed them. Sable's first. Her dress is a bit easier to get into. Lori pointed me to a chair in one of the small dressing areas and disappeared behind a curtained-off area. Caroline had followed, more curious than anything else, He firmly believed that most human clothing was worthless, though thought it would be smart for me to have a suit of armor. That, at least, was practical. I pulled out my phone, checking on some notes about my paper, when I heard Sable. I looked up and sucked in a sharp breath. Her hair was up in a messy bun, which it wouldn't be for the wedding, and she didn't have any makeup on. And it didn't matter. She was stunning. The dress, in an ivory white, had a sweetheart neck with cap sleeves that plunged down, showing off a tantalizing amount of cleavage. And then there was a fitted bodice that dropped in a waterfall to the tops of her toes and the heels she wore. The bottom was trimmed with stones the color of the corite opal. As she moved, it glittered and sparkled, and I swallowed. You look stunning. Sable looked at me, chewing on her lip. You sure? I was going to do my hair up in a net of tiny braids with copper and blue ribbons. 
Sable, you are gorgeous. Joe might either start crying or assault you there at the altar. Sable giggled, and Lori beamed at both of us. I loved making this, and it is so elegant. Here, turn. Lori pointed at the top of where the rhinestone started. I set it up so she can lift it and secure it at the waist so it will become a cocktail dress for dancing. I watched her closely as she lifted and fastened the top of the rhinestones to hidden catches at Sable's waist, and it turned into a simple, elegant dress that hit Sable at right above her thighs. Wow, that is really impressive. Spin, Lori said, grinning. It will hold. I used to sew for the Vegas showgirls. They taught me tricks you wouldn't believe. Laughing, Sable spun in a circle. The dress looked just as elegant now as it did with the skirt down. I love it. Thank you. Lori looked at her. I need a hammock where we pinned it with those shoes and finished the darts. But yes, it looks good. Lori waved another girl in and smiled at me. Now to Joe and her masterpiece. After seeing that, I'm wondering how you will top it. No top. Compliment. Much more fun. She bustled into the other room, where Joe stood dressed in what looked like a white corset that sucked in what little stomach she had and lifted her breasts up so even her modest cup size looked impressive. Ah, good! You got the undergarments on. This is actually more comfortable than I expected. Joe ran her hands down it. A pain in the eyes to get on, but comfortable. If you knew how many women were surprised by that. Well, come on, slip on those heels and come let me get you dressed. I sat down and waited, wanting to see when Joe walked out. They had wanted Marisol to be surprised too, but they had talked to her about them. I knew this because I'd overheard it but they wanted to walk down the aisle with their fathers to be special. It took odd sounds and a tussle of fabric. Then Joe walked out. Oh, I breathed out. I'd seen Joe dressed up, dressed down, covered in grease, in a swimsuit, and naked. And I'd never seen her look like this. The sleeveless gown was lace flowers, curving around and under her, the center of each one with a brilliant blue crystal. The dress ended right above her knees, snug enough to highlight her assets, but loose enough she could move. From the waist down was a solid white skirt that poofed out and made her look like a princess. The color against her nutmeg brown skin almost glowed as her hair cascaded around her to her waist. So her voice trembling. I'll do up my hair in ringlets, and we got more crystals to weave them in, and lots of bobby pins. Joe, I struggled to find words. I've never seen you look more stunning, but I suspect on your wedding day, you and Sable will eclipse the sun. Two of my queens look properly attired. Caroline spoke from behind me, sitting and gazing at Joe. I approve. Remember, we talked about dancing and cocktail? Look! Lori reached up and disconnected the overskirt, and suddenly Joe was in a short, elegant cocktail dress. There are hidden zippers here at the back of the legs to unzip and give you more freedom of movement, but with a little transform magic, you can even alter the color with the change spell. She grinned at Joe giving you multiple ways to wear the dress. Joe looked at me, her eyes questioning. I laughed. Joe, when you walk out like that, every person in attendance is going to wish you were there for them. She let out a long breath. Good, but I only want you and Sable. Well, Sable wants you. You're just stuck with me like a bad fungus. Mmm, mushrooms. Joe replied with a grin. Okay, Cory, your turn. I repressed a groan. My enthusiasm was low. They looked wonderful. Even after learning to dress better, it still felt strange to see that elegant woman in the mirror. Jeans and a t-shirt would always be what I felt most at home in. Cory, go ahead and go back to where Sable was. 
My assistant will be waiting there for you. Lori shooed me away as she went to help Joe get out of the gown. I traipsed back to the other room, Carolyn following. Sable was back in her simple skater dress, and she all but glowed with excitement. Corey! She pulled me into a tight hug, and I hugged her back. It is so pretty. My dad will love it. So will everyone else. You look wonderful. I meant every word. They were both so beautiful that I knew I was the daisy to their roses. Wait until you say yours, and I know exactly how to style your hair. With all of us having hair to our waists, we had to make sure it was up and easier to deal with. Remember, this is your wedding? I teased. I'm just the bridesmaid. Nope, person of honor. You are the only person we need up there with us. There was something about her tone that made me narrow my eyes. But before I could follow up on it, Joe walked in. Let's see the creation for Corey. She pointed at the assistant patiently waiting for me, and I headed that way. I'd worn a decent bra and panties today and stripped without any worry. My modesty levels were non-existent, and I suspected these women had seen more naked female flesh than I even wanted to consider. Okay. Close your eyes. I'm going to pull this over your head and zip it up. They asked you not to bake until you were on the dais with the mares. Lori had a bundle of fabric behind her, and all I caught was a hint of blue. I just shook my head. They love their surprises. I know. Those two are adorable. Now, eyes closed. With my eyes closed, I felt the dress slip over my head and put my arms through the sleeves which meant, while it wasn't strapless, it was more sleeves than Sable's dress had. It felt snug, and I could feel patterns under my hands. I didn't think it was brocade, way too heavy for a summer wedding in Georgia. So, lace? Intrigued now, I had slipped on the soft heels that added a spare inch to my height, and after they zipped me up, I let them lean me out and up on the dais. Oh, Corey, you look amazing. I opened my eyes to see Joe and Sable staring at me, dopey smiles on their faces. I blinked. Normally, I only saw that look when they were being all lovey-dovey at each other. Not sure what I was expecting. I turned and stared at the woman in the mirrors. My hair was in its normal, messy twist, easier to deal with. I rarely wore makeup, and it didn't matter. The vision looked powerful, beautiful, and somehow more. The dress was in the same lace as Joe's dress, but with a sweetheart neckline to match Sable's dress. It had three-quarter length sleeves and was a mermaid style, with the skirt poofing out at my knees, where Joe had little crystals of blue on her white lace. I had blue lace with little crystals of copper. It cupped and smoothed my body, though I probably needed better undergarments. I couldn't take my eyes off the woman that stood there. The skirt detaches also, giving you a dress to wear anywhere. And there is another hidden zipper in the back with a copper gusset to make it looser when you wear it like that. Lori spoke, and I nodded and turned one way, then the other, admiring it. It looks like you merged the two dresses, I finally said, still a bit speechless and amazed how good the colors looked on me, the copper and blue sparkling at me. They asked for it, along with something for multiple uses. I think this will be stunning for a reception. And I think you know a transform mage? She grinned at that last part, and I laughed. <laughs> I might. I bet I could get her to change colors on it if I wanted. But I love this. I smiled at my sisters of the heart. I love this so very much. Sable grinned, leaning her head on Joe's shoulder. Told you, you're stuck with us. My powerful queens, I choose well. We laughed at his smugness. Don't get too smug, Gerlian. You have something to... Joe said, and he froze, tail raised. That would be... His head turned as she strode out of the room, 
but returned a minute later. This is for you, and yes, I expect you to wear it. He looked at the copper and blue bundle of fabric with suspicion. And what is that? Sit, I'll put it on you. She glared at him, and he narrowed his eyes, but sat. A minute later, he wore a snazzy vest in dark blue, with copper buttons and a small pocket on the left side. There! It looks nice. I promise no bow tie, and there is a place to put the rings. Carrying them in your mouth is gross. He walked over and jumped up on the dais, looking at himself in the mirror. The ruby red of his fur against the dark blue was pretty, and together, we looked like a matched pair. He peered this way and that, checking his range of motion, then looked back over his shoulder at Joe. I approve. Excellent! Lori, you'll make the final alterations in these, and Corey, you'll pick them up that morning? We all nodded. Lori had a bit of hemming to do to match our shoes, but it looked like our wedding party would be gorgeous. Chapter 4 The forming of a coven was authorized in 1893 when five women wanted an official name for the commune they were forming to work on magic. As they were all widows and past the age of childbearing, it was granted. Time has made the perception more lenient and often more polyamorous in nature. Magic Explained Online School ramped back up, and everything seemed to be coming at us full steam. I had my thesis defense, graduation, then the wedding, then I started my draft. The next few months would be crazy busy, but I couldn't wait. I was tired of school and stressing over the draft while dreading the wedding. Not for bad reasons, just it was one more thing looming over my head, and I was anxious to see them married— and my draft started, so maybe with a good job, we could figure out our lives and have something stable that didn't change every semester. The Monday of my dissertation defense approached, and I was ready to scream. Indira and Stephen would be in the audience, and I already knew the president of the college would be there. She was still pissed at me for the amount of drama with my first year. With my luck... She was probably showing up to see if I crashed and burned. You sure you don't want us there? Joe asked yet again, frowning at me. Gads, no. I just want to present, get grilled, and be done with it. It is bad enough you and your family are showing up for my graduation. Glory, of course we are showing up for graduation. Joe huffed at me. You're the first person in our family to get a doctorate. Then we're going to the Brazilian steakhouse for dinner. All of us, and Sable and I are treating you. Joe, that's a lot. She cut me off. Remember, I have a real job now, pays good money. Sable has a better job, pays better money. And we all still are pretty frugal because none of us have time to do anything that would spend money. Point. I sighed. Sorry, I'm stressed. Just want this done with. Then the wedding and... Shoot you two off on a honeymoon. Long weekend. We only get ten days of the first two years. Sable is fifteen, but that will be next year. I nodded. No matter who you worked for, the government controlled the draft, your paycheck, and health insurance. Year one and two, you got ten days of vacation each year. Year three and four, it bumped up to fifteen. Then you went into the job market where most of the careers started at 21 or higher, though you did get all federal holidays off. Merlins were there for 10 years, so at year five, we jumped to 20 and stayed there for the rest of our time. Oh well, not like I had any place to go. Fine, long weekend. You will still enjoy yourselves. I've got all my notes ready, and I think I can handle anything they throw at me. Joe rolled her eyes. Corey, you wrote a Merlin Blasted book on the subject. Not really. It's only 40,000 words, and at least 5,000 of that is footnotes and references. I protested, but I couldn't really disagree. You know, this backwards and forwards. Now, come on! 
We are going out to eat. Sable wants sushi and you need to relax. Yes, I want ahi and salmon and some eel. Carolyn appeared from nowhere, his ears and whiskers point forward. Yes, oh fluffy one, Joe said, rubbing his ear. We met Sable at the restaurant, ate way too much, and for a while I didn't worry about anything. Monday morning found me in a small classroom. There was one biology student ahead of me, and I sat outside and waited, reviewing my thesis and conclusions yet again. My research was on genetic markers between mages and non-mages and power levels. I had found a pattern that only seemed to exist in mages. What I hadn't said was I had also found an enzyme that only mages seemed to possess. What fascinated me, though I'd never be able to publish it, was that Carolian... Esmir, and Banyarl also had it. Though Hamadia had nothing close enough to blood to be able to carry enzymes. The door opened, and a young man stepped out. A fire mage. He looked gray, and his shirt had damp spots under his armpits. That bad? He nodded. It's like they stacked the deck to destroy me. But I passed. I'm done. Come on, draft. I want this over with. Good luck, I said. I took a deep breath, then headed into my last hurdle to graduating. I stepped in, and the person at the end of the table looked at me. Miss Monroe? Yes? Please provide your copies and take a seat. He gestured at the chair in the middle. I'd been instructed to provide four copies of my thesis, and I set the bound books on the table and turned to take a seat. I gazed across the people here and swallowed. Indira Humbert and Stephen Alexant, my mentors and fellow Merlins were there, as were the president of the university, Melinda Kilton, and a flash of color up top told me Georgas was here. That completely confused me. Why would he care about a research paper? He knew I wasn't revealing the shared enzyme, but... I didn't have time to pay attention to him now. Swallowing, I took a seat and reminded myself for the zillionth time that I knew my research backwards and forwards, and knew stuff they would never ask about because it wasn't in the paper, which they had all been given a month ago. I swear, sometimes half the stuff we had to do was just to remind us we were the lowest of the low. That helped my mood. Both magic and academics were mind games and I needed to remember not to play. No matter what, I was still going into the draft. I still had friends, and I still had a wedding to go to. I cast my fear and doubt, my inner dragon slipping out, and smiled at the board. Good morning. The man arched an eyebrow at me, but nodded. Miss Monroe? Merlin, Monroe, if you please. I countered with the long-ago lesson from Gar, a fashion consultant. They were still apropos. His eyes narrowed, but he nodded. Of course. Your thesis is DNA markers in mages? Yes. If they had really read it, they knew the bombshell I was about to drop. But somehow, I doubted they had more than skimmed it, and I had purposefully buried the text of the paper, not the synopsis. It would be interesting to see if they asked me about that but I had proved the accuracy of my hypothesis. There were genetic markers for mages, though there seemed to be no differences between power levels. Excellent. I'm Dr. Ralph Thorman. This is Dr. Galisa Wright. He nodded at the woman of East Indian descent to his left. And then we have Richard Forrest. He pointed to the man on the far end. And I'm sure you know Professor Cornier. I nodded at all of them. Professor Neer was one of the biology department heads, but not the one that had overseen my thesis. It would be interesting. Richard Forrest and Galisa Wright seemed familiar somehow, but not enough that it jumped out at me. One thing I should mention is the three of us, excluding Professor Neer, are heads of the companies looking for promising biologists for our companies. So, 
Be aware, not only are we here in research review capacity, but we are also on the lookout for prospective employees. So do yourself a favor and treat this as a job interview. I fought to keep my face serene, but I really wanted to squee with excitement. I now recognize them. They were some of the department heads for R&D labs that loved to get Merlins. I might not get in during my draft, but I'd heard of them pulling it off occasionally. But either way, if I impress them, they might remember me when my draft was over. Suddenly, a decade seemed like forever. The draft had better put me someplace good. I need to be doing as much R&D and working in labs as possible. Of course. Nice to meet you all. They nodded back. Then Dr. Thorman launched in. Justify your sample population. Explain your control set. What about the positives you found in the control set? What about familiars? How did you randomize your sample? What variants did you find? Did the genetic pattern you found cross ethnicities? How did you know? What standard deviation did you find in the control population? Theories behind the variants. The questions came at me fast and hard. No sooner had I finished one question when someone else hit me with another. I had my own copy of my paper, as well as notes. But I'd been living in this data for months and knew it inside and out. My research was solid. Then came one of the questions I'd been waiting for. You noted three anomalies in your research, and you said you threw them out after noting they had entered both pools. What does that mean? Professor Near asked. She'd been silent through most of it, just letting the other people hammer at me. I focused on her, though I watched the others flipping through my paper rapidly. There were three participants in the control section that emerged during the research. They let us know and agreed to allow us to take new blood samples. And all three prior to their emergence, the gene sequence was not present. Afterwards, it was. They all stopped and stared at me. Dr. Galissa took off her glasses and pursed her lips for a moment. Marlene Monroe, are you telling us you found evidence of genetic changes after emergence? Her voice so quiet in the room that I had to concentrate to hear her. Yes, I said, not offering anything else. And you didn't lead with that why? Mr. Forrest asked. In fact, I don't even see it as mentioned in your brief or your conclusions. While the facts are inescapable, and I listed the outlier and the cause in my paper, do you really want to add fuel to the fire by pointing out that mages are genetically evolved or changed to reach the general populace? There was a sharp intake of breath from behind me. While saying that mages have certain genetic characteristics that make them mages is no different from pointing out the genes that give someone blue eyes or blonde hair, to point out that their genes are changed by emerging as a mage creates the window for cries of genetic tampering, gene manipulation, even asserting that humanity is stripped away. I did not feel that was a wise thing to make public. Dr. Thorman hit a button and then leaned over to talk to the others. It must have disconnected the microphones because I couldn't hear anything. They talked for what seemed like forever. Hard whispers, with the occasional word slipping out. Dangerous. Smart. Research viable. Draft. But not enough for me to gauge where the conversation was going. After five minutes, that seemed like hours, they turned back to face me. Dr. Thorman hit the button again, a sour look on his face. First, Merlin Monroe, we applaud your foresight in not disseminating this information, and we'll be forwarding it to the OMO and the draft board. But you can pretty much assume that aspect of your paper will be classified, and you will not be allowed to publish it as it stands. I nodded. That didn't surprise me, 
and I wasn't worrying about publishing papers much for the next decade. Though, after that, I'd have to bust my butt. The reasons for Merlin's doing research and being secretive burst into my brain, and I almost laughed. They had to because of the draft. It was the only way to make up for lost time and truly dig into what they wanted to know. For me, it was all about magic, emergences, and death. Understood. Editing out that part is easy enough. And it was. Samples were thrown out all the time, and I had done most of the sequencing myself. Outside this room and my advisor, I didn't think anyone knew. Excellent. Marilyn Monroe, your methods were stellar. You detailed everything, and your conclusions are rock solid. Congratulations, Dr. Monroe. He actually smiled at that last part, and I felt a grin start. Thank you. You still need to deal with the college and the paperwork. But good work. Everyone up there nodded at me, and I fled out of the room as soon as I could, Indira and Stephen following me. I didn't see Georgas, so I still didn't know if it had been him, or if I was seeing things, or anything in between. Congratulations, Gory! You did it! I'm not surprised they classified some of your findings. Indira gave me a hug, and I squeezed back tight. Over the years, they had both proved to be people I could count on, no matter who tried to manipulate us. Well done, My doctorate was nowhere near as challenging. The advantage in getting it in criminal justice, I just had to create a good case study. Steve gave me a hug, too. Thanks. I'm just glad it's over. I paused as President Kilton walked up. Marlon Monroe? She said, her voice dry. President Kilton? I responded with a slight nod of my head, my body tense wondering what curveball was about to be thrown at me. I must say, your presence at the college has ensured the last few years have not been boring, but I will not say I am sad to see you go. I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors, and I sincerely hope I do not have to deal with the outcomes of them. She gave me a brief smile and strode away. The three of us looked at each other, and snickered. (laughs) I have to say, I almost feel bad for all the troubles she's had to deal with over the years. I said, well, I never tried to cause trouble. There had been more than a few things over the years. Whatever. It is behind me. What are your plans now? Indira asked as we walked towards the parking lot. Wedding next month, then the draft. I'm going to try to work and probably take as much of the load off Sable and Joe as I can until my draft starts. Indira nodded. I have a research project I would like some assistance with, she said quietly. I remembered the phrase in our mentor contract that I did owe her research assistance. Sure. I knew that had to come before my working. At least I wasn't as desperate for money as I had once been. But still... I needed to make sure I could carry my portion of the rent and utilities, and it had been close occasionally. What do you need help with? Microplanar rips within this realm, she said. Okay. Remember how you can talk to Joe and Sable via mind speech, but only if they are nearby? I nodded, thinking. We could do it, but only with Carolyn could I do it over long distances. I could talk to Banyar and Esmir by opening a rip to their plane and talk, though. We weren't sure if it was just that they were more magical so it was easier, or if there was something else blocking the ability for them to talk to me. I think the problem is a magical connection, or actually a frequency connection between you three. When you are near each other, the frequency is easier to form, but when in different parts of the house, you can't form it. My theory is that if you create a micro-rip in this realm, between your location and theirs, you will be able to talk. Huh, I said, working it through my head. It might work, and if it did, it would be huge. But part of me thought maybe that wasn't all of it. Sounds fascinating. When do we start? Next week? 
You need to finish up with school and make and get started before you get too tied up in wedding plans. We separated at the parking lot, giving both of them final hugs, and I headed home. Carolyn had stayed home as I didn't need his snarky comments distracting me. The walk to the apartment would do me good. Corey, I would like to speak with you. I jerked my head up and looked around, confused. Who? There wasn't anyone around though most realm denizens could appear as invisible. It is your gas. I feel it would be best if I was not seen. You can speak like this, correct? I blew out a breath and kept walking. Yes, though I am slower at it, but I can. Then we shall speak like this. There is concern among the lords that the information regarding enzymes and the genetic changes to those graced by magic will be disseminated. I wish I knew where he was. Talking to someone without being able to see them was frustrating, especially given the topic. But I doubted the body language of a phoenix would tell me much. I haven't passed on the enzyme information. As far as I know, the only humans that are aware of it are my degree advisor, Indira, Stephen, Joe... And Sable. The genetics will not be published, at least as far as people changing when they emerge. There was silence as I walked, but I didn't rush it. The Phoenix and I didn't talk often, but when we did, he was always measured in his speech. Have you followed the logical extrapolation on the presence of the enzymes? I sighed. Yes. At some point, most of the magical beings either originated from or started life on Earth. It was the main reason I hadn't included it at all. I had my theories, though. Which do you think it is? This time, I fell silent. I hadn't even talked to Caroline about my thoughts. I'd mentioned the enzyme to Banyarl and Esmir, along with the fact that I wouldn't write it down anywhere, and had destroyed all samples and deleted all records. The only place the information existed was in a few mines. Most beings in the other realms originally came from Earth. My mental voice was quiet as I said the words. I am not old enough to remember. No one still existing remembers the forming, though we know the cause. But I suspect that is accurate. I thank you for your discretion. Magic chose her herald well. I will see you at the joining ceremony. There was the weird sensation of feathers in my mind. Then nothing. Georgas? I asked, but there was no reply. Forming? What forming? I'd end up spending most of my life trying to get my questions answered. The conversation rattled around my head, but at the end of the day, it changed nothing. No one was home. Both Joe and Sable were at work and Carolyn must be out gallivanting around. I changed clothes, then logged in to finish filing everything for my degree, the start of my draft, and my entry into no longer being a student. I was actually excited. The wide variety of options for research under the draft sounded exciting. The next decade should be busy. But first, I had a celebration dinner and then a wedding. Chapter 5 All unions are legal agreements between the individuals and the court of law. The law does not care if the agreement is between men, women, or multiples of either, as long as the forms are filed. The religious issues are taken up by each church. The Catholic Church still does not recognize multiples of the same sex, while Wicca only requires informed adult consent. History of magic. Time vanished on me, and before I knew it, we were driving up to Rockway the day before the wedding. I owned a piece of paper declaring me a doctor, and I was determined to make my future bright. But first, I needed to celebrate a day of joy with the two sisters of my heart. Merlin, tomorrow. I can't wait. Joe smiled at Sable, her face radiant and I almost blushed just watching them. 
If anything, the approaching wedding had increased their lovey-dovey emotions. It was sweet and amusing at the same time. Me either. Be nice to have our long weekend in the Caribbean, though. Sable turned to look at me. Joe was driving, and we were almost at the hotel where we were spending the night. The Guzmans were going to be a full house with relatives, and we realized a hotel, and not needing to fight over bathrooms, was easier. Joe was staying with me in my double room, while tonight Sable would have the king to herself. After they were married, it would change. They were both very adamant about not seeing each other the day of the wedding. You know what we need to do today and tomorrow? Joe asked, her hand holding Sable so tight across the space between the seats that I was surprised it didn't hurt. Yes, mommy, I teased. I'm dropping you two off at the hotel to get ready for the rehearsal and dinner. I'm going to get the dresses, drop off the sealed envelope to Laurel, and then check on the cake and delivery times. Tomorrow, Stinky will come to get Sable, and I'll drive you to the community center. You both have separate changing rooms, and I'll help you both, as will your Tia Joe. Then your dads will escort you, and I'll precede you. So, quit worrying. I rattled it all off, without missing a beat. We had been over it so often, I suspected I'd be dreaming about it. Laurel Amison, our town police chief, had agreed to officiate, and we had the nice community center lawn for the wedding, while the reception would be in the center itself. I had no doubt that it would be gorgeous. Okay, okay, Joe laughed out the words. It will be fine. I just want the day to be perfect for all of us. She lifted up Sable's hand and kissed it. I'm sure it will be. Then the next day you leave for the resort. That was the wedding present from Sable's dad and Marisol's parents, an all-inclusive for five nights. They'd begged work to give them some extra days, it was part of the reason, I only found out this last week, they'd been killing themselves with 60-hour work weeks, trying to bank time for their honeymoon. Yes! Sun, beach, booze, my love. Sounds perfect to me. I just laughed and ignored the slight pang of wishing I ever felt that way about someone. But I had a good life with friends and family. The next few hours were a whirl, but soon enough, I was at the community center with most of the wedding party. The party included Sable's dad, John Lancet, Sable's aunt, LaShonda, the Guzmans, Laurel, and the center manager, a perky older man named Leslie Inger. Marisol ordered us about like we were her soldiers for an invasion, but soon enough, we had the steps down and managed to figure out our places. They went through the service, and even if the final ceremony part seemed off to me... I let it be. It was their ceremony. Carolyn played his part to perfection, and you would have thought he was the star of the show. When we were done and about to head out to dinner, Joe and Sable were over talking to Laurel, their heads bent in serious conversation, while Marisol pulled me to the side. Thank you so much, Corey, for introducing me to Esmir. She's a delight, and I dare say we have become friends. I smiled and hugged her. Good. I like her, too. Who's coming to decorate in the morning? I looked around the lawn. The chairs were laid out and the arbor was in place, but I knew there should be ribbons and flowers. Ah, oh, that is covered. Friends are coming to help me and the boys in the morning. The wedding isn't until 1 p.m. and we should be done by 11. Her smile seemed mischievous, but she kept on talking. Your job is to be dressed and to have those two lovebirds ready to go, along with one calf. I laughed. <laughs> I can do that, I think. They'll have their makeup and stuff done before we leave, and Joe will do mine. So we should only need to pull on dresses and shoes here. We got this. They'd better. This place will be fit for two queens. They better enjoy it. Marisol looked torn between threatening to kill someone or crying if it wasn't. I'm sorry I couldn't do more to help, but I'm sure it will be perfect. Guilt assailed me as I hugged her again. You are busy getting your doctorate, Marisol protested, glaring at me. I have a doctor in my family now. That was important. The flush of warmth that flooded through me made the hug even tighter. I love you, Tia. I said the word softly, my aunt in love if nothing else. Always, 
Now, if we could find you a nice person to settle down with, she said a bit wistfully. I think you'd be better focusing on Sanchez. I don't really ever see myself getting married or having children. I shrugged. But maybe you can talk Caroline into fathering a litter? Wait, what? The exclamation came from the calf who had been lounging in the shade waiting for us silly humans to hurry up and head towards the food. Oh, that would be excellent. He was so cute as a kitten. I am not ready to be a father. Besides, gather matriarchal. The mother would decide everything. I would have little to do with it. He sounded almost desperate. Marisol shrugged. Evolution means changing things. Maybe the Goth should start raising their children in a more village-like situation. Her eyes darkened for a minute. Losing children hurts. I remember Joe telling me once that Marisol had miscarriages, and I put that together with Caroline saying Esmir had lost a litter. Well, you won't lose us. I'm afraid you are stuck with all these crazy women and one crazy cat. I reassured her as I watched Joe and Sable head our way, Laurel trailing. Bueno, she whispered. Let's eat. I'm starving. Everyone ready to go? Joe asked, all but bouncing on her toes. I gave her a hard look. Absolutely, but no more caffeine for you, or you'll be wound up all night long. Joe pouted, but nodded, and we rounded everyone up, heading out to dinner one last time before their lives changed irrevocably. Dinner was full of laughter, stories from Marisol and Henry about the trouble Joe and I got into as kids. John Lancet and his sister LaShonda shared Sable's more mischievous actions. By the time it was done, John and LaShonda had become honorary members of the Guzmans, and we were all hyped on life and a bit tipsy. Chapter 6 Question Do mages have better or weirder marriages? Answer. Research has not codified what effect magic has on reproduction rates, the stability of a marriage, or the quantity of non-traditional partnerships. All statistics point to the same percentages as among non-mages. O-M-O-F-A-Q Sable crashed in the big room by herself while Joe crashed with me. The rooms were adjoining, and they were both adamant about not seeing the other before the wedding. I set the alarm for 7 a.m., anticipating a frantic morning. Come on, Joe, up. I've got coffee waiting for you. Shower so we can deal with your hair. I prodded Joe, who rolled over, pulling the covers over her head. Don't wanna, she murmured. So you don't want to get married today? I cast Lady Luck yet again. I'd make myself go bald to make today as perfect as possible, if I had to. Wait, today? She sat straight up in bed, looking at me, panicked. Today? It's today? I laughed. Yes! Get your ass in the shower, Jojo. We need to get started on your hair. ASAP! Joe sprang out of bed, headed for the bathroom. She paused at the door and turned to look at me. I love you, Corey. Never forget that. I took in a deep breath, letting that emotion settle into me. And I love you, but Sable would kill us both if you aren't there on time for your wedding. Joe grinned and tossed me a salute, then dove into the shower. I had woken up early, jittery and stressed about all the moving parts today. I'd showered, shaved, had the proper undergarments on, and felt almost human. My hair was still wrapped up in a towel, and I wore the hotel bathrobe as I got more coffee ready. Carolian was sprawled out on the couch in the suite, though I knew he was awake, just pretending not to be. He had learned long ago to not be underfoot when we were trying to get ready. I knocked on the adjoining door. No answer. I slipped into the room and stared at the bed, laughing. Sable slept like the dead and sprawled over it like a crashed starfish, Half the covers were on the floor, the other half twisted in knots around her body. You getting up or are you going to lay there all day? I'm awake, just having panic attacks. 
She lifted her head, her curls twisting around her like tersane snakes. Over what? Marrying Joe? I sat down on the side of the bed, watching her. No, I love Joe. I love you. I love the relationship you two have. I love that you accept me into it. Just things like, what if a tornado hits? What if I've gained 20 pounds and the dress doesn't fit? What if the cake doesn't show up? Or Laurel? She sighed and pulled the sheet up over her head. Huh. What if it all goes wrong? We should have just eloped. I understood her fears. I had experienced more than my share of nightmares over the years about failing classes, or losing Joe, or someone else trying to kill me again. But this much I did have an answer for. Does it matter? Sable pulled down the sheet, her dark eyes peering me over the white fabric. Does what matter? If it all goes wrong, if the cake falls, if the dresses are ruined, if no one shows, does it matter? Do you still want to marry her? Yes, Sable said, even as the last word left my mouth. Then why are you stressed? You will have a wonderful day. Things will go wrong, and at the end of the day, you'll still be married. I tried to give her my wise, all-knowing look, though she was a few years older than me. Sable looked at me and started laughing. <laughs> You're right. I'll still be married to her. She twisted and turned and managed to extricate herself from the sheets. Once she could get up, she pulled me into a tight hug. How did you get so smart? I squeezed her back. Easy. I've had everything go wrong. And all that mattered was I made it to where I am. Get going. You have a hair to style and your aunt should be here soon. I knew she'd washed it yesterday to be ready for braids today, though they would be loose and woven with ribbons. Yes, I have the woman I love to marry today, and an incredible family to start. She gave me a watery smile and darted into the bathroom. I started coffee for her and called in a room service order for both of us. A knock at the door sounded, and I went to open it, revealing LaShonda. I'd met her a few times over the years. She was much more reserved than her brother, and I always got the feeling she wasn't sure of Sable's choices. But last night, she'd finally relaxed, and I'd realized she loved her niece so much that she'd just been wary about me breaking Joe and Sable up. Morning. She's in the shower. Excellent. The dress? LaShonda was taller than me by about an inch, and all jiggles and smiles this morning, unlike her much leaner niece. Dresses in the garment bag in the closet. She has all the ribbons and pins for her hair. I've got Joe's hair and makeup. We've been practicing. But Sable swore you'd be just fine. I ended with a lilt in my voice, vaguely curious. That child! I ran a Braden shop for over a decade. And what we decided on will take me less than an hour. <laughs> she laughed a rich laugh that brought my smile to the surface. Sounds great. I'm next door, and I started coffee and called up for some food. It's going to be a long day. You, child, are a marvel. Now go get that girly ready and yell if you need help. You figured out her hair? Hairstyles among mages were intricate as our hair was so long. But we talked and practiced over the last few weeks in the evening. And while the massively intricate braids that you saw some mages with, especially if they had hair like sables, weren't possible for us... Joe didn't want that. What she wanted, the two of us could handle. I slipped back into the room and shut the door, leaving Sable to LaShonda, and I started in on my day of prettifying. It was more fun than I expected. I got her into her undergarments, then, after she had fully dried her hair, braided and twisted and wove. We did a loose fishbone weave with her mass of hair, using the sides of her hair as a net to contain the mass of hair, then I secured them all with bobby pins she'd specifically ordered that were copper with blue tones. When I was done, it looked like gems held her hair back in a cascade of braids and curls. They had both decided to forego veils, so we dropped a simple, baggy t-shirt dress over her and let her finish her makeup. I sped through my hair creating a lace of braids to hold it back and secured it with Joe's best person gift to me, 
a stunning copper comb with the three symbols, colors filling in my branches, matching my tattoo. I gave Joe 15 minutes to do my makeup. I almost never wore it, but today I would. Pictures would make me look washed out otherwise. My phone chimed as Joe finished with my makeup, and I checked it. 11.30. We are here grabbing Sable. You too good? It was from Sanchez. He would drive Sable and LaShonda to the venue. Yep, let me know when you've left and we'll head out. Food there? Yes, mommy put snacks in each dressing room. See you there. Marisol had said she would provide some very simple snacks the girls could eat as they did the final touches. It took about 15 minutes to get to the community center from here, and we wanted to make sure Sable was ensconced before we headed out. You about ready? I looked at Joe. You have the lint roller Caroline's outfit in the ring? Yep, I said, but I got up to double check. Everything is in the dress bag. We're ready. Shoes? I could see Joe going into panic, but just checked and made sure. Yes, and I have my phone and the hotel key cards. Okay, but what about... Joe, stop. I'll tell you the same thing I told Sable. If it all goes wrong, does it matter? Joe looked at me, her makeup and hair making her look almost unreal with beauty, especially matched with the rather ugly orange dress. No, it doesn't. Just the two of us. Even saying the words seemed to calm her down. I rolled my eyes. Marrying her is what matters. So, deep breaths. My phone beeped. They're almost here. Let's go. Wait, need to grab something. She paused to dig in her suitcase and shoved something small into her cleavage. Okay, I'm ready. What was that? I asked, laughing. Good luck, charm. She said, smiling at me. Let's go. Come on, fur boy. Keep the shedding to a minimum. Caroline yawned and jumped off the couch. That is not an ability I possess, though I will attempt to not bless you with my beautiful fur. Your generosity is noted, Joe said formally, even while grinning at me. As it should be. Don't think I don't see your humor. Humans. No appreciation for the important things. He sniffed and headed to the door. Laughing, Joe and I headed out, me in a loose t-shirt dress like Joe, and both of us looked much too nice for what we were wearing. And we didn't care. We giggled most of the way there to be met by Leslie Inger, the community center person who led us to our rooms. He seemed a bit pale and stressed out, I got the feeling he wanted to talk to me, but I stalled him for a minute. Joe didn't need to hear any of this. I got Joe settled, our dresses hung up, and told her I'd be right back. She waved me away, focusing on the munchies waiting for us. I stepped out, leaving her and Caroline alone. Is everything okay? His eyes were a bit wild, and I looked around for Marisol. We were in the office area, so from here I couldn't see the community center or the setup outside, which meant I wasn't sure what had him stressed. Had the cake shown up but been dropped? In theory, I might be able to use pattern to reassemble it, but that was risky. Pieces of paper were much easier than towering cakes. I knew about the familiar, and I was warned one or two other mages might attend that had them. He spoke slowly, as if trying not to scream in between each word. I nodded encouragingly, though really if Erichina caused this big of a reaction, he needed to get a grip. But no one warned me about... them. He managed to hiss out the last word, his Adam's apple bobbing. Them? I asked, now completely confused. Follow me he ordered with an abrupt burst of energy. I held up a finger and stuck my head back inside Joe's room. I'll be right back. I need to check on something. She gave me a side look, but waved her fingers. Go. Mommy left me mini empanadas. I'm fine. Well, save me a few too, and don't give him any with onions. They make him fart. I ignored Carolyn's protesting in my head and turned to Mr. Inger. Why don't you show me what is concerning you? 
His eyes widened, and he turned, scuttling down the hallway to a door to the outside. It was propped open, and I knew Joe and Henry would go out this door. That much had been beat into my head last night. I followed him out and turned the corner to the building and paused. Tersane, Bane Jarl, Esmir! I called out with joy and headed over to them, glad I hadn't put on my nice shoes yet. You came! I wanted to give them hugs, but didn't want to mess up my dress, and I wasn't sure how Tersane would react. Mr. Inger trailed behind me. You were expecting them? I shrugged. Hoped, maybe. They are friends. They won't do anything. I turned to them, ignoring the man who looked like he was about to have a nervous meltdown. I'm glad to see you, but you are awfully early. People really won't start showing up for another hour or two. Yes, we know. But Esmir was insistent that she got to show us around the area and the decorations before the ceremony started. Banyarl's voice rolled through my mind, and I smiled and turned to look at the layout and froze. I'd been expecting ribbons, maybe some flowers, but what I saw made my jaw drop. All the simple folding chairs were covered with alternating copper and blue fabric, The rug for us to walk upon was a mix of copper and blue matching the colors exactly. The simple arch where Laurel would stand was gone. In its place was something of copper and blue stone in a lattice work that caught the sun, creating reflections of colored light everywhere. It looked fantastic and magical and not at all like a simple wedding. This is incredible! I turned to look at Esmir. You convinced Marisol to use magic? She was a fire mage, and I knew she could melt and twist metals, so seeing it only surprised me because I rarely saw her do more with her fire than cook and keep things warm or cold. She is the most talented, but rarely uses her skills. Together, we created this. The fabric was easy to weave together once we found the right colors, Your people are woefully restricted about their skills. Ah, but here Marisol asked me to deliver these bouquets to you. Esmir's tail lashed over and picked up a basket with three sets of flowers in it, all of them wrapped in ribbons that matched the copper and blue, but the flowers were nothing I recognized. White flowers with silver edges, blue bursts of petals attached to white stems, and gold-pink vines wrapping through them. They are beautiful. From the realms? I didn't think these were earth flowers. I lifted them and sniffed, smiling as sweet, fresh scent met my nose. It reminded me of honey and spice, yet with the crispness of ozone. I'd never smelled anything like it before. I offered. One of my sisters has gardens that are renowned, I thought they would be appropriate for Magic's Herald. Tersane was calm as she looked at me. She even wore a fancy wrap around her that was an emerald green, so bright it rivaled the grass. It twisted across her chest like a snake, wrapping and enhancing her curves. Well, I'm not getting married, but thank you. It is beautiful. Everything is. People should be arriving soon. Don't eat anyone. I grinned as I said it, and Tersane laughed. I had not planned on it, but I don't dare speak for Esmir. Oh, please, that would not be entertaining. They don't run enough to make it worth the chase. I stopped for a moment and looked at the calf and the griffin. Esmir wore a necklace that had a bright red stone at chest level, which radiated against her emerald green fur. Banyarl had something similar on his chest, though he had a clear crystal. They gleamed in the sun. You all look very handsome today. Thank you for coming. Is Georgas going to show up? Oh, I'm sure he will. He prefers to make an entrance. I tried to ignore him. His ego is too big as it is. Esmir said with a sniff, but she preened a bit at my comment. I laughed. (laughs) I see. Well, I need to get back to getting ready. I'll see you all in a while.
Still smiling, I turned to see the pale Mr. Anger at the corner of the building. They're fine, let them be. I can guarantee you they will be better behaved than most guests you've had. He gave me a dubious look, but didn't say anything as I headed back in. The basket in hand. Two bouquets were identical, the third a bit simpler, but with a single rose in it, though this rose looked like a rainbow, every petal a different color. I knocked on the door. Sable should be in. It cracked open, and LaShonda appeared at me. Hi! Everything okay? Yep, I said, and handed her the flowers. Oh, these are... Her voice trailed off, looking at the wonderful bouquet. I know. Need anything? Nope. Finishing up now, getting her to eat a bit, and convince her nothing's going wrong. Tell her the place looks stunning, and she won't care because Joe will look more stunning. LaShonda laughed. <laughs> Sounds about right. Go, child. Today will be perfect. I know, because they're getting married. LaShonda smiled at me. That too. I just shook my head and went back to see Joe. She had an empanada in one hand and was carefully eating it, though I knew she'd waited to do her lipstick until she could brush her teeth. Here, from Tersing. Joe looked at the flowers and gasped. <gasps> wow, those are incredible. She took the flowers gingerly. I'm not going to pick my finger and fall into an enchanted sleep, am I? I crossed my arms and stared at her. If you do, I'll go get your true love and have her kiss you. Joe grinned. Deal. She took a sniff of the flowers and smiled. That was kind of Tersene. Which worries me, but I doubt there is any malice. Joe shot me a look with a hint of a smile at her lips. Why are you so weary of her? Because she's super powerful? So are you? She pointed out, and I made a face. I try to forget that. I held up my hands at Joe's glare. I know, I know. Dragon, own it, live it. Just when I spill my coffee on myself, time doesn't really make it go away. I'm still human. And that is why we all love you. Some would accuse you of false pride. I just think you'll never see yourself as truly powerful. Now, if I could decide if that was a good thing or not. I stuck my tongue out at her and grabbed an empanada. Let me eat this. You fix your makeup and put on your lipstick. Then we will get you ready to go. Chapter 7 Mage or not, marriage still remains a choice that 63% of all adults in the United States make. Counting only legal unions, the divorce rate among mages are 3% less, but that is only where both partners are mages. Bottom line, marrying a mage makes no difference. Marrying the person you want to be bonded to for the rest of your life is the important choice. Magical Relationships People stuck their heads in occasionally, checking on us and making sure everything was on track, and I darted out to reassure Marisol, update the coordinator, and the other myriad of things involved in making a wedding go smoothly. An hour plus should have been more than enough time to get us both dressed, the final touches on and ready to go, but we were still trying to get shoes on when there was a knock at the door. Yes? It's me. It's time. You ready? Henry Guzman's voice came through the door. I moved over to open it, nervously smoothing down my dress. He'd been more of a father the last few years than mine, and I wanted him to approve. Swallowing my nerves, I pulled open the door and smiled at him. She's ready. Any more waiting, she might combust. Oh, Cory, I had the on the... His words stuttered out. Muy bonita, elegante. I felt my eyes heat as he called me the daughter of his heart and told me I looked elegant. His approval was better than anything I knew. Wait until you see Josepha. I stepped back, out of the way, and revealed Joe to him. Mi hija. He sobbed, pulling his hand up to bite his palm as hugging her tight right then would have messed everything up. He let the tears flow as he looked at Joe in front of him, her dress with the blue stones, lace hugging her body and the skirt, matched perfectly with the hairdo and pins we had put up. 
I couldn't imagine anyone looking at her and not falling head over heels for her. Sable is a lucky woman, and you had better save two dances for your puppy. Always. Joe glided over and hugged him, not caring it might rumple anything. She straightened and looked at me. We ready? I looked at Carolyn, who had his vest on and the rings inside the pocket. We checked three times. I handed Joe her bouquet and headed out. The plan was for me to walk down the middle of the guests, while Joe and Sable were escorted by their fathers down the outside. I had reached Laurel first, then Carolyn, and together Joe and Sable would approach. Mr. Inger was waiting for me, and he looked like he'd calmed down a bit. You exit the building here. Wait for the music to start. Thank you, I said quietly and stepped to the door. I peered out at all the people, and I knew the majority of them. Charles was there, Erichina on his shoulder. Tersane and the others were near the back on special benches. Friends from college, family, and Laurel were waiting for me at the dais. The music started up, an instrumental version of Cohen's Alleluia. I thought it was funny song for the entry, but Joe and Sable both smiled secret smiles and just said that was what they wanted. The chords of Alleluia surrounded me as I walked down the aisle. The ribbons and colors, the complete beauty of the setup paled when I saw the joy and love in Marisol's face. Tears slipped down her face, and I saw Sanchez reach around to hug her from behind. She leaned back into her son's arms and beamed at me as I walked to Laurel. Laurel wore a dark robe with her hair unbraided and wild in a corona of joy that went halfway down her back. She smiled at me, and I knew my face would hurt by the time this day was over. I saw Stephen Alexand and Indira Humbert smiling back at me, and I wanted to run over and hug them both, but that would have to wait. Charles smiled at me, and Arachina waved. So many friends that I was bouncing with joy at the knowledge they were here for Joe and Sable. I reached my spot at one side of Laurel, and just off the first level of the platform. That was Carolyn's signal to start walking, and he did. Head held high, chest out. The copper vest and his fur gleamed in the sunlight. I fought not to laugh as Esmir's tail lashed out and zinged his rear flank. I saw one ear flick back and his eyes narrow for a moment, but he didn't stop walking and came to rest on the side opposite of me, posing with his tail wrapped around his feet as he sat upright, gazing towards the building. The music changed, swelling louder as from either corner of the building, Joe and Sable approached. John walked next to his daughter, proud in his uniform, medals glittering. Henry in his tuxedo radiated pride as he escorted Joe. The gasps from the people watching and Marisol's loud sniff and me almost made me tear up. Mirroring each other, they walked down either side of the chairs, then approached towards us. Joe to my right, Sable to my left. I knew how awesome Joe looked, so I focused on Sable and felt my smile go even wider. The sweetheart neckline framed her face, and the braids were woven with ribbons that rippled down her back, creating a wave of blue and copper as she walked. Lashonda had created a fancy snood for Sable's hair out of tiny braids, something well beyond my abilities. It let her beautiful smile create the perfect accessory. The flowers sparkled, and I almost thought they glittered in the sun, but nothing came close to the joy on her face or the look of pride on John Lancet's. They approached from either side, the smiles on both faces enough to make you cry as they saw each other for the first time. I fought the desire to sniffle, Best persons aren't supposed to get weepy. John and Henry smiled at each other, and they handed Joe and Sable to each other. Their hands grasped each other so tight I could see white around their knuckles. Then they faced Laurel. The music faded, and Laurel looked out at everyone. 
I am honored to join Joe and Sable together in a union of love and faith in each other. We all know magic is a rare gift, but finding a love that changes your life is even rarer. When you are graced with both, you know how blessed you are. Joe? Laurel turned to Joe, who swallowed. Her eyes locked on Sable. Sable, for her part, had burgundy-tinted cheeks. The first time I saw you, I thought you were the sexiest woman I'd seen in years. As I got to know you, I thought you were the most interesting woman I'd met in years. When I fell in love with you, I knew you were the one I wanted by my side for the rest of my life. Carolyn walked over and pulled the ring out with his claws, his opposable thumb not causing him to get up to mischief for a rarity. He handed it to Joe and sat back watching them, waiting. He was so owed a brushing for all this afterwards. Joe took the ring, rose gold with a channel of sapphire chips in it, and slipped it on Sable's left ring finger. With this ring, I promise you my life, my love, my magic until death sunders us apart. Sable stared at the ring and smiled, her eyes glittering with tears. I first saw you. I thought you were sexy, but too arrogant for me. Then I watched as you sacrificed everything to save a stadium of people. I knew I wasn't good enough for you. Then I saw the love you had for family and friends and I knew I'd spend the rest of my life basking in that love. Sable turned to Carolyn, who handed her another ring, this one with chips of what I knew were topaz in the channel. With this ring, I promise you my life, my love, my magic, until death sunders us apart. Laurel beamed at both of them. Then, by the power granted to me by the state of Georgia, I pronounce you married in the eyes of the state and those that will hold you to your vows. They leaned in and kissed, a kiss so passionate I turned my eyes away feeling like I was intruding. Now for the next part, Laurel said, and I jerked my head back to her. Next part? Next, she was supposed to introduce them as a couple. The recessional should play, and we would go inside for the reception. What next part? Joe and Sable turned to me, their smiles huge, and they almost glowed with joy. Corey, I have loved you as my sister since the day we met, Joe said, with Sable standing next to her. Corey, you welcomed me and provided love even though I didn't know how to treat you. Sable's voice was clear and carried like a knife to my heart. You are my friend, my family, my love, and my support. Joe looked at me, and I wanted to flee, to let my knees buckle, but I stood eyes wide, heart racing. You have become my sister, my friend, my joy, and my support, Sable said. Her hand was entwined with Joe's, and I didn't understand what was happening. In the same voice, they spoke. We ask you, in the name of magic, to be our third, to be our love, our family, our support. Will you do us the honor of joining us with the blessing of magic? I felt the tears running down my face. I knew I should blink or something, but all I could do was stare at them. You want me to marry you? Join. Form a triad. You will be our partner, our family, and under magic, it only dissolves upon death. Joe still smiled at me, not worried or stressed. But this is your wedding. I started waving at everyone and I froze. Rather than anger or confusion, I saw joy and hope on the faces that looked back at me. Even on Esmir and Tursain, I saw hope. This is our joining. Will you do us this honor? Sable said again. Carolyn pulled more rings out of his pocket. A set of three I had never seen. He handed them to Sable and looked at me. Ears and whiskers pricked forward, waiting. To be with them, a part of them. To be loved and wanted. 
There was never any doubt as to my answer. Yes! I had thought their joy was already writ large on their face, but with that answer, they glowed. Together, Sable and Joe slipped a ring on my right ring finger. Then Joe dropped the two extra rings in my palm. Hands shaking, I slipped the rings on their right ring fingers, not believing this was happening. Our right hands joined in a triangle of fingers and firm grasps. By magic you are joined. By magic you are linked across all the realms. By heart and soul. Laurel's voice carried more weight than it usually did, and there was a palpable pulse in the air. I looked at my hand, that Joe and Sable both held. Colors appeared rippling around, and a line of symbols from ring finger to wrist appeared on all our hands. It gleamed bright as a rainbow, then disappeared. Blessed be magic's herald and her triad. The voice chimed in my mind, and I yaked my head up to look around us. And from the expressions, I figured everyone had heard it, though I had no idea who had said it. It wasn't familiar at all. I felt magic wash over me, and my dress changed. Where it had been blue lace, the color drained away, filling half the copper crystals, leaving me in a white lace gown with blue and copper crystals sparkling all over it. So mote it be. Laurel looked a bit pale, but her smile was genuine. Ladies, gentlemen, and other beings, it is my honor and joy to introduce spouses, Josepha and Sable Lancet, and their triad partner, Corey Monroe. As one, we turned, my hand in Joe's, and Joe between Sable and I, the music started to play, I Choose You, by Sarah Borellis, and my throat went tight. Everyone stood as we started to walk down the path with our guests, our friends, our family, standing and clapping. I lifted my hand and stared at the ring gracing my right hand. It was titanium, with a diamond-shaped channel. Nestled in the middle of the channel was a stone I'd never seen before. It glowed with colors and a faceted stone. I could barely think, but I felt my magic being pulled and stretched, then settling down into a new shape I had never felt before. It is a royal estuarine, mined only in the Ordo realm, appropriate for my son's queens. Esmir was purring so loudly I could hear her as we walked by. I finished walking, and we entered the reception area, only for Joe and Sable to pull me into a tight hug that almost had me bawling. You are ours, forever and always, they whispered in my ears. And you are my queens, Carolyn chimed in. We paused in that moment to look at him. He flicked his tail, but answered the unspoken question. You share magic now, and my enhancements. You will both find your null branches at Pale, and you can borrow power from Cory if needed. Though, I would have always helped you before. Now, you are mine to help her magic. Okay, that I wasn't expecting, Joe murmured. What were you expecting? I was still in shock. To form a triad, a legally recognized entity. It works as a marriage, but with three. That magic would approve was only a minor thought. We wanted to protect you, surprise you, make this day yours as much as ours. Sable murmured all of this as people started to drift in. Later. But remember, we love you. Joe and Sable pulled away as we were smothered by friends and family. I was surrounded by well-wishers and love. I kept stroking the ring, binding me to the two best people in the world. I glanced down at Carolyn. We should have gotten you a ring, too. You are as much a part of this as we are. He flicked an ear and let his tail brush my cheek. It is not needed. The three of you are in my heart. That is all that matters. I looked at Joe and Sable and grinned. Yes, 
That is all that matters. I moved to join them and was welcomed with open arms. Final thoughts. Wow, what a ride. But that was just one story in this series. You can find the rest of series on Amazon. The Twisted Luck series has five books out and three novellas. You can find all the information on my author page here. Remember, if you enjoyed this book, please leave a review. Amazon, Goodreads, they all link and help authors like me sell more books, which means you get more stories to read. Don't forget to sign up for my newsletter and join the Facebook group. Can't wait to get to talk to you. If you would like to follow me somewhere else, check out all the places you can find me here. Mel. Author's Note. Hey everyone, I'm Mel, and I'm super excited that you picked up this book. This is a novelette of the Twisted Luck series, and is best read between Inherited Luck and Drafted Luck. If you'd like to see what I'm up to, you can sign up for the newsletter at the link www.badashpublishing.com slash newsletter. There are free short stories in my newsletters, updates as to what I'm working on, and occasionally recommendations for other books. You can find the Facebook group for this series by searching Twisted Luck Fan Group. Just a reminder, here's the cover for Joined. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here. Weddings are never easy, but a wedding for your best friend has its own certain brand of joy. Joe and Sable are getting married, and I'm going to be their person of honor. Easy, right? Between defending my dissertation, dealing with wedding plans gone wild, freaking out brides, and my own misgivings, it's going to take a miracle to get us all to the altar. But sometimes just loving someone is enough. If I have to use magic to make it perfect, I will. This is a novelette set in the Twisted Luck series. It is best read between Inherited Luck and Drafted Luck. Get ready for some tears and remembering that love doesn't have a defined form. Thanks, everyone. See you at the end. Mel. Now the novella joined. This has been a production of Joined, a Twisted Luck novella. Written by Mel Todd. Narrated by Autumn Juliet. Copyright 2021 by Melissa Todd. Production copyright 2022 by Autumnal Audio.